Now a passionate Melbourneian, Guy Edward Pearce was actually born in England in 1967. When he was three, his family moved to Australia and it was here that he developed his interest in performing. By 10, he was involved in local theatre and musical productions and already showed a talent for mimicking accents. But what many don't know is that as a teen, he also developed an interest in bodybuilding and at 16, he won the Mr Junior Victoria bodybuilding title. Now that's what I call multi-talented. With a hunky physique and raw acting talent, he was easily cast as Mike Young in the TV soap Neighbours just a few days after finishing high school. He played the role for three years, earning instant heartthrob status, and more TV roles followed on Home and Away and Snowy River, The McGregor Saga. Although blessed with a chiselled jawline and fashion model looks, after leaving Neighbours, Guy consciously shied away from the hunky lead roles, instead preferring offbeat projects. Then, in 1994, his first major film breakthrough came in the loud Aussie film The Adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Guy turned heads in lycra and sequins, playing the bratty, spoilt, cross-dressing Adam. He's a fantastic, solid actor, and he does a lot of research, and he's like a chameleon. While Guy has admitted he's often anxious about his work and fame, one thing he's completely comfortable with is his feminine side, and he's not afraid to explore it through his work, obviously in Priscilla, and again in the Aussie gender-bending comedy Dating the Enemy. After all, he believes so much of being an actor is about how you respond to feeling fragile. I like the, uh, the notion of balancing things, essentially, whether it be drama and comedy or pathos and, you know, whatever. He brings a real sense of the inner life of the character and the believability, and he's always different. And he doesn't do it with a sense of preciousness and leave me alone, I must get in, you know, I, don't talk to me, I'm Houdini. He comes on and he's done his own work. When he walks on the set, you know, when the camera turns, he's absolutely in character and absolutely spot on. The success of Priscilla led to Hollywood and Guy landed his first US role in the Oscar-winning LA Confidential, playing the priggish cop Ed Exley. But it was fellow Aussie co-star Russell Crowe that got all the sex symbol attention. Unfazed, Guy took on a range of anti-sex symbol roles, playing a cannibal in Ravenous, a straight-laced prosecutor in Rules of Engagement, and a brain-damaged Leonard Shelby in the mind-bending noir Memento, directed by Christopher Nolan. So was working with the legendary director part of the film's appeal? He has an incredible ability to deconstruct things, deconstruct movies that have been made before and analyse them, and really, He's just got a, a wonderfully sort of sensitive perspective on detail and what makes a person tick, you know, um, and obviously uh, a very interesting perspective on this character because he's in such an extreme state. Continuing to throw himself into roles that didn't capitalise on his good looks, he then starred as the villain in The Count of Monte Cristo. Instead of flashing a white movie star smile, he was intent on displaying extremely bad teeth for the role. And he really went the extra mile when filming the sword fighting scenes, even getting himself injured. Jim managed to actually wound me. Uh, I'll show you if you like. Just a little, just somewhere down there. These are the things that, you know, that you have to put up with as an actor. But Jim's great, don't get me wrong. Whereas I'm really erratic and emotional and <laughs> a, bit of a, a bit psychotic, you know. Next guy gave action a go with 2002's lukewarm special effects fueled time machine. Guy threw himself so far into the dark role that he injured himself again, breaking a rib. You know, it was fun, it was gruelling, and um, it was interesting for me because I had to keep reminding myself that I was kind of making a, a big kids action movie, you know, or adventure film, which is not usually the kind of thing that I would do. Although Hollywood has offered many exciting challenges, Guy loves the opportunity to return home to Australia to work, like in The Hard Word. If I can find something that I enjoy doing at home and is, I suppose, um, allows me to, to be creative or inspires me in a, you know, in a positive enough way, then I'll always much rather work at home than work away. As Dale in The Hard Word, he had to play a broad range of emotions, going from being funny to gravely serious and quite maniacal. So did he find this type of character challenging to play? In one way it was a challenge, but at the same time it wasn't because it was written so 
beautifully by Scott in the first place, you know, that he tread that line between, as you say, sort of maniacal behaviour and this kind of, you know, just a sort of kick back, wry sense of humour, which I think is something that is very innate in the Australian culture anyway. Two more Aussie flicks followed. The romantic lead in Till Human Voices Wake Us and the critically praised The Proposition, which saw him return again to the Aussie desert. So were there any similarities to his previous experience working on Priscilla? I mean, obviously the subject matter was completely different. So, you know, I, I think the experience that my the experience that my character was going through in this film was was vastly different to the to the last experience in the desert. So, so that really kind of dictated it. But but um, but both were very pure kind of experiences. So, uh, on some level, they were they were similar. You know? In 2006, Guy took on two challenging biopics from playing the legendary pop artist Andy Warhol in Factory Girl to the famous magician Harry Houdini in Death Defying Acts. Playing real people, he was determined to portray them authentically and in both cases really immersed himself in the characters, both mentally and physically. Uh, I had this frame set up in the apartment that I was staying in uh, that I was hanging upside down uh, for half an hour a day or something. The breath holding exercises that, that I was doing, which were a great help, I mean, I, I, I was sort of able to hold my breath for about a minute and a half, I think, when I, when I first got there. And then after half an hour or something with this, with this guy, the guy that I trained with, um, he's able to hold his, he's like the English champion, he can hold his breath for like seven minutes or something, which is really bizarre. Uh, he just gave me one exercise to do and suddenly I could hold my breath for two minutes. So really, it's, it's quite astounding, uh, you know, the stuff that I learnt as far as what we can actually do to ourselves to, to transform. When you think of the, the, the film he came off before he, he did Death to Fine Act, he was playing Andy Warhol and he was this thin. And, you know, you see pictures of Houdini and he's, you know, he's pretty buffed. and. And I, Jill told me that he'd been doing a lot of work in the gym to, um, you know, to build up. And I went, wow, that's a lot of building up to do in such a short period of time. And he did. And he's that kind of actor. He throws himself into, into a role. And Guy probably didn't tell you this, but in the end, his scenes underwater, he could hold his breath longer than our stunt guy could. And he learned to get out. He got out of the straitjacket. We didn't trick it. I mean, truly, Guy can now go up the road just about. <laughs> and do half of Houdini's act, which is, is, is really nothing like Guy as a person because Guy is actually very shy and retiring and doesn't want to be noticed. Throughout his career, Guy has taken on a number of big budget Hollywood films with varied success and has found more praise doing left of centre indie films and revealing his character's dark sides. So does he now purposefully avoid doing the big Hollywood blockbusters? Not necessarily. I mean, I, I um, you know, I mean, I, I've been asked to do some in the past, and they haven't necessarily been great. And if they've been great, they'll usually offer it to someone else. So, I mean, I'm doing an Adam Sandler film at the moment, so that should be a bit of a blockbuster, I imagine. Looking at Guy's career and preference for avoiding the mainstream, you'd never expect him to end up in an Adam Sandler film. So, did he enjoy the experience? It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was really silly, and uh, you know, quite a change from things that I've done before and you know you still take seriously what what you're doing while you're doing it but but you know it was very loose and it's a bit like kind of being with a group of school friends just making it up as you go along you know I mean I find every role I play brings out my inner child in a way you know I, I think I need that in order to kind of get to where it is you've got to get to you know but this I think probably brought out my outer child Although Bedtime Stories was a lighter film, he still played his trademark dark and twisted bad guy character. Someone said to me the other day, oh, you do nasty very well. <laughs> so maybe, you know, maybe there was something particularly nasty about this character that I kind of enjoyed the idea of getting into and portraying. Unimpressed by fame, Guy is motivated by quality projects and chooses his roles based on a combination of things. Sometimes it's the great story, other times it's the director, but he generally likes to take on characters that he has a genuine sympathy for. He believes as an actor you should disappear into your character and therefore has been unafraid to camouflage his good looks with a beard in human voices, oily hair in Time Machine, tattoos in Memento, and shocking dental hygiene in Monte Cristo. For Guy, it's all about embodying the character he is playing. I always like to think that 
You know, when people sort of watch something and they go, oh, you could really tell that you three really liked each other. And you go, well, it shouldn't matter whether we really liked each other or not. It should be down to the fact that we acted like we liked each other. I mean, any film that you work on, it's really tricky to, and very difficult to maintain the, the tone or the quality of the film that's there on the page in the translation of that ending up on the screen. It's a really difficult thing to do. And a lot of times it doesn't work, you know, and I've worked on films where it just doesn't work. That's not the same as that. And you go, well, if I knew it was going to be that, I wouldn't have done it, you know. In spite of his success, Guy doesn't like the spotlight, as he wants his characters to be accepted at face value, uncoloured by assumptions based on roles he's played in the past. I'm sure I inadvertently mix things up because, you know, depending on what I've just done might, in, might determine what direction I'll go in next. But I can never know what scripts are going to come my way. Things just come my way and I just jump on board the thing that feels right at the time, and that might be a war story or it might be a story of uh, an intimate sort of little drama set in somebody's house. So. I don't really look, I just kind of wait and see what I, what I can find. Um, and I just try and follow things that feel real to me in a way. Down to earth, relaxed with a self-deprecating sense of humour, Guy Pearce has successfully transitioned from a small screen heartthrob to a big screen success story. He continues to make brave choices and is willing to go there, which is what makes a truly great actor. Stay tuned to Star Picks for all of the movies you know and the actors you love. Broadcasting glorious high definition with 5.1 surround sound where available. For more of the best in entertainment news, check out your movie network channels. It's all together better on screen and at mnc.tv.